It's really excited to um, be back here at Stanford. So kind of a little bit of backstory about me before going into Cadium. Um, but first, a small disclaimer, I'll be telling you guys a couple things about the internet. So for everyone um, on the internet as well, I will just say kind of, uh, please be cool and just use this to improve the security of the internet. Uh, there are a lot of things that are broken that we find out there and it's really kind of all of our job to help fix them. So uh, first, a bit about me. This is my original uh, SUID. Um, so th I'm actually quite proud. I, I, I'm, I kind of call myself a Stanford lifer. I was here for three degrees, so bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Um, and my proudest accomplishment was I got three pieces of paper, but I only needed one Stanford card my entire time, and somehow this survived. So I don't know if they make them like they used to, but that was me uh, back, well, 13 years ago now. And I want to say that kind of the good start and what was really exciting to me to talk here is kind of the stories about kind of my own journeys at Stanford, how they led me into entrepreneurship and really kind of share those with you. So um, undergrad, um, I was a physics major, um, partially because kind of I always loved math in high school, kind of uh, came in with a lot of momentum. And then out of that uh, became a double E first co-term and then a PhD student doing a large scale optimization and machine learning under Stephen Boyd. And a lot of this says, you know, this is kind of you know, a typical story. You start off at Stanford, you get kind of more applied into tech, you do all these great things. And where my story, I think, kind of differs is I have a bit of a non-traditional twist in the middle that kind of led me um, to a different path and really led to the founding of Cadium. So uh, in year three of my PhD, um, I get a call from a friend of a friend who later winds up becoming one of my co-founders that there's something really cool going on in DC. He can't tell me anything about it, but I should come out there and just check it out, uh, and I shouldn't go back to a hedge fund. So um, it turns out that what is going on is a, a DARPA, the advanced R&D arm of the Pentagon, is running its first operational program since Vietnam to basically do large-scale data analytics for the warfighter in Afghanistan. And the director herself is picking specific grad students in academia to come and join this kind of crash effort because uh, 10 years in, the war effort was still not going well and she, and she wanted a lot of new blood and new ideas. Um, so what started off as a summer internship for uh, three months quickly extended to me being full-time, quickly extended to me becoming lead data scientist for all of DARPA and then nine months later being in Kabul, Afghanistan um, on a Black Hawk. And in this case, you can't see it, but in the lower right-hand part of this, uh, we're actually hand delivering um, many, many terabytes worth of hard drives because it was actually faster to take a Black Hawk from airbase to airbase than actually send it over the networks. And it was really our job to understand lots of different complex data sets together and give turnaround time um, in days or ideally hours to the most senior of commanders of the war. Um, so that's where my story kind of differs is that I really went outside of Silicon Valley and it really just started with a call from a friend of a friend who I trusted. And then there were a sequence of steps that kind of took me to very different aspects of what I was doing, but at every step I was able to leverage existing skills while also learning new ones. And what started out as really kind of large scale machine learning, you know, make the models work, make them scaled, really led to understanding what kinds of questions should we be asking rather than the specific methods we should be answering them. How do we actually deliver value to our customer, who in this case was uh, Kam Isaf, the four star general in charge of the war. And then as a 25 year old grad student in a war zone, um, how do you actually have theater wide policy changed based upon your recommendations? Um, and that cycle was very, very instructive for me because that was really kind of the first step of, you know, you start off and you're a one person consulting outfit with an extremely important customer and how do you understand the business cycle? And that kind of kicks you out of a lot of mentalities in the Valley that are gonna be more typical about kind of how you should start a startup, how you should kind of do MVP, kick an idea around. For us, this actually started off as a very, very mission driven a culture of we have real problems, people are getting killed every day, we wanna make that happen a lot less. So uh, this is our first office. This uh, picture was approved for public release, but uh, we kind of joke that uh, this is actually what workstations look like um, in war zones <laughs> in certain areas. And you're doing a lot of different things, but it's kind of out of this scrappy environment that really we grew um, as, as a company. So uh, my co-founders and I, we all cycled through here, uh, kind of replacing each other over the course of 2012. So um, I kind of joke that I did study abroad Koppel uh, for, for, for four months. Um, in fact, at this point, I was actually not affiliated with Stanford. Um, I dropped out of a bit to actually pursue something that I believe very deeply in for our country. But this actually started out very much 
like a startup environment. We were backed you know, by the entire US military <laughs> um, and a lot of other things. We had lots of resources, but when I actually came to it, there were kind of all the standard things that you would have with startups. Like Hadoop would go down <laughs> quite regularly. We would have many, many issues with uh, data transfer being flaky. Um, sometimes systems wouldn't come in. Other times uh, data would be partially lost. Um, and in some cases, it would, it would be because a hard drive was shot. And in other cases, it would be that something was uh, was uh, corrupted, but it actually taught us lots of ways of dealing with imperfection in a, in a place where I have not worked harder, where you're working 16 hour days, seven days a week, and that's part of the mission. And that really kind of stuck with us throughout the founding of KDM and really kind of initiated us into this start scrappy, understand complexity and kind of bathe in it, and then ask good questions of that, that if you get an answer, you can actually believe in. So uh, with that is kind of background on me. I'm gonna say uh, it's called Kidium. There's the phonetic pronunciation. So where are we now? We're um, NSF. We are now 40 people, uh, 25 engineers. Um, over half of us are from Stanford. So this is kind of, you know, I'll, I'll say the beginning, then the end, and then how we got there. Uh, really what we do is we secure the internet for the largest customers in the world. So I believe we're now, it'll say we work with both US Cyber Command and the Navy to protect all of their networks for, uh, excuse me, for defensive purposes, and really kind of absolutely top customers in the Fortune 100 and the Fortune 500 across a variety of sectors. And then by summary, we're backed by um, absolutely stellar investors. Uh, we did a $20 million Series A led by Scott Sandell, who's on our board, and really more than any other company, we've leveraged our advisors very, very well. And this is something that I'll talk about later, but both uh, Dan Benet at Stanford, and then also a number of other people really in industry and the military, Dave Dorman, um, who's also on our board, and Sandy Winnefeld, who's the former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's also the technical advisor on Top Gun. Most of you probably aren't old enough to know that movie, as I've discovered with our engineers, but uh, it's a great movie and you should all see it. And this is kind of where the company comes from. That's kind of our origin story at the very beginning. This is where we are now. And then um, if some of you have, have read it, uh, we now have marketing headlines like this being written about us. And we don't really have too much control over this. My mom now uh, kind of jokingly refers to me as a DARPA darling, um, much in my own chagrin. But I wanna talk about the story of how we kind of got from Afghanistan and doing kind of really cutting edge research on very complex data to doing what my company does now, which is really understanding all devices on the internet and then helping companies secure all of them globally. So what Kidium focuses on, we call it the device layer of the internet. And this really goes back to most people experience the internet. It really is kind of oh, what's on your mobile phone, what's um, on your web browser. It's actually the web application level content. This is you know, of what of Google indexes and crawls. Um, but that's only part of the internet. You're kind of missing all of the infrastructure. You're missing everything that enables that to be possible. And if you look at it, about 80% of traffic is actually not web. It's a number of other categories. And really, all businesses have very poor understanding of these other devices that are on facilitate the internet. And a lot of these have a number of problems associated with them, specifically with security. And for us, what we discovered kind of having access to large amounts of data and empowering um, our users was that if we could build a data set associated with every device on the internet, we could actually help build a solution for all companies. So what, what we did kind of spinning out from DARPA and what initially started as a protect a critical infrastructure mission has since evolved into kind of a comprehensive index of all devices on the internet that we've continuously indexed by actively sending packets to all public facing IP addresses in the world essentially every hour. Um, and really our first business case, and what I'm gonna be talking about today is primarily security. There are other extensions that we take things that really go off of a lot of the lessons we learned way back in the day from our initial DARPA days about how to conduct actually, you know, research and development to production, ideally same day <laughs> in some cases. And then also what's, what sorts of questions we should be asking, not just what sorts of methods we should be using. So um, a brief background on cyber, cybersecurity because for a lot of people it's kind of an interesting topic with a lot of headlines and uh, as students almost um, all of you have not been involved in IT in any way and it's probably very boring. But uh, basically the traditional view of security really is that you have a perimeter, you have kind of a castle, you have a moat, there's a lot of marketing material based upon metaphors of you know strong walls, uh, moats, defensive mechanisms and you kind of assume that your network is yours, you know everything, and everything outside of it is kind of a scary wilderness, and that your job is to be on that wall and guard that wall. Um, really, the reality now is that um, all perimeters are porous, 
and it's actually much more um, a question of do you have visibility? Are you able to react and identify quickly rather than can you keep everybody out perpetually? And the interesting thing about this is that networks that now you're responsible for that now affect you, you don't control and you don't see, but you're still gonna be held accountable for. And this provides kind of a very thorny problem for many, many people because how are you supposed to protect that which you don't know? And for us, the grand conclusion that came out of this was really only a whole of internet approach can solve these problems. And step one is really visibility into everything that is relevant for you. And only if you start from that step can you actually understand other aspects um, of your security. So um, kind of our hidden truth that our, our company is based on really is that the internet is now small. And by doing many different kinds um, of cost savings across kind of storage, bandwidth, computation, it's now possible to actually periodically communicate with everything and get continual awareness about everything in the environment. Uh, going back to our early days, one of the biggest problems were gaps in understanding. And it was that if you didn't have data on something, you really could not make a statement one way or another. There could be a model to fill in uh, parts of the data, but it would always massively bias your analysis. And from step one, what we really took into our current business was an understanding that we need to have data about everything in order to be able to make reliable statements about the whole of the world. And really kind of our goal now is that network defense can finally be faster than attackers. And one third of breaches, um, as, as I've reported in a wide range of modalities, are from these exact kind of failures. I'm gonna show some examples of those and then kind of connect things up where it really is the fact that if you don't know what you have on your network, it is impossible to protect. And we offer the first solution that really enables you to see both what your network is <laughs> and where it is even if you didn't know to look. And that's massively Im important because otherwise uh, bad guys can take advantage of those gaps that you see. And again, this is translating a lot of things that we saw that were kind of failures for things in operational environments now um, to successful deployments um, in, in both the enterprise and commercial spaces. I can also pause if people, if people have any questions. Um, so I'm gonna kind of pause and say, uh, this is something that not many people are familiar with, but the, the internet is broken <laughs> in a lot of ways. And a lot of these are exposed devices not meant to be here. And what we would call these in, in past environments would be weak points on the internet. And for just one, one manufacturer, there are over 10,000 exposures of different control systems that you can understand. And these control systems of control everything from a building appliances to actually the power going into and out of computers. And normally if they're managed well by a network administrators, these are used for traditional maintenance. If they're exposed on the internet, all of a sudden a bad actor can take and do very, very bad things. And a lot of our initial projects kind of came out of DARPA after our Afghanistan work that really seeded the company. We're about understanding what are the aspects of critical infrastructure that can actually show national level vulnerabilities? And are these important and are these fixable? And what we actually showed very initially was that not only were these problems identifiable, but that with a couple clicks and two lines of code, it was actually possible for a bad actor to shut down about 5% of the internet. And it was this understanding of both the large, and if you see here, most of these are concentrated in the United States and Western Europe, <laughs> um, our allies, that really kind of said, wait, we can take a lot of the, uh, uh, excuse me, the analysis methods and really the data collection methods that we're using for kind of a much higher order form of protection, but we're actually gonna see that it's not just nations that have this problem, it's not just the biggest players, it really is everybody at this scale that has these problems and that has these issues and really how we grow and understand the business is kind of drawn off this um, aspect of, it wasn't kind of the methods of analysis <laughs> that we wanted to use to analyze this, it was actually, what are the right questions we should be asking next on this data set? How does this chain together and how does this grow? And I'll give you an idea, this is kind of a zoom out picture. If you zoom in, um, and this is a specific example, this is um, real data that's been anonymized for a Fortune 100 company. Um, their entire building headquarters was online. Um, you could do things like, uh, sorry, if I do not have a mouse, but um, if you see here, unfortunately I have to anonymize a lot of this for uh, public consumption. But um, as you can see, um, all three phases of the motor current going to the rooftop chiller were just available and accessible. Security doors are available and accessible. You can tell the humidity in rooms on 15 minute time intervals. Um, this is literally by sending a normal packet <laughs> to a specific IP address in a specific way. 
And this is why we say that much like we came out of a very mission-driven environment from Afghanistan and from DARPA, um, what we do now really matters because at the end of the day, like people actually can die if this happens. And it's really our job to say that we need to keep this strategic view in mind of kind of what is the ecosystem of all devices? How does this impact security of individual orgs? But at the end of the day, if you actually zoom in, like there are hundreds of people that work in this building. Um, and it matters to me and it matters to all of us that not only can we identify this and you know feel clever, we can actually fix it by working with them. And a lot of that really is kind of understanding both how we create the algorithms that do this, how we create all the technology, but then also how we connect it with a business sense and actually both uh, solve problems and, and do well by doing good. So I'm going to kind of close um, and start, start to kind of close things with what our understanding of the internet was is much like I think how a lot of people understand organizations, especially when you're coming kind of from university settings. There are these abstract entities. Um, you have kind of a marketing sense of what they're like and you assume they're great. So for top tech companies, you assume you know everything is perfect. It's all really well organized. Like I think this is how if you ask most, most people, they would assume the internet is like this. Um, if you're fans of the show Silicon Valley, there's episodes where they go into data centers and everything is very dreary, but it's very, very well organized and there are kind of boxes everywhere. And really what our strength is and kind of what has inspired us to kind of go from this one mindset of kind of you know individual consultants in war zones <laughs> to founding a company to then understanding the problems of organizations has been that when you actually peek closer, things really look like this. And this has been kind of our attitude, which is if you can actually see that things are like this and actually make it actionable, as opposed to just understanding um, that there is some dysfunction somewhere, but that there's actually a problem that you can fix and then go with that, that's what's really kind of inspired us at every step because Again, this, this was not an immediate idea that we had. This was kind of a sequence of events where we started off with kind of you know, an understanding of a mission-driven organization for problems. We then discovered kind of over a course of ways, new ways that we could protect different aspects of the internet. And then at every stage we expanded to say, what if we included the entire internet? How do we have this entire view? How does this start to inform everybody? And then from that, we have kind of a number of things that we can solve, but also a number of business cases that we've built up. So um, I'll, I'll kind of say that there's still a lot of problems here. We have something called the internet wall of shame that we really kind of view as if people should be fixing a lot of these problems. Um, the, uh, the, this was actually started by one of our early engineers, but for us, it's actually the fact that we can take what we've learned, kind of have this path that we went through, and then actually fix a lot of these problems. So I'm gonna talk um, a bit about lessons learned and then specifically talking to people, I wanted to leave more time for questions, but um, in kind of my path, I've really viewed this as a continuing ed education for me since uh, I jokingly call getting a PhD 21st grade. Um, most of you are probably gonna graduate 16th or 17th grade soon, um, but really kind of the path for me and really the path for a company has been understanding new things as we've grown and kind of what's applicable and what's not. I'm gonna kind of talk a bit about these. So. The first one that's really benefited me is uh, frequently stepping outside of our comfort zone and uh, areas of expertise. And I'm gonna kind of tell vignettes around this. So the first one was just saying uh, yes to go to essentially kind of a job interview in DC when, I'll be honest, I was kind of skeptical that it involved the government, there was a lot of very cool things going on in campus um, and um, in Silicon Valley, but saying, you know, I actually will be willing to go out um, and take a chance to interview for a week for a project that I, I can't be told exactly what's there, but it sounds kind of interesting. It sounds kind of cool, I'm in. Um, second one there, saying that you know, after I've had a couple months on site, I've had some success with some of my methods, actually stopping out of Stanford because it both seemed that there were great people around where I was and that the work I was doing was cool. To then, um, you know, much to the chagrin of both my parents and my girlfriend at the time, to actually say I will deploy to Kabul for four months <laughs> and lead this effort at any step of those ways, um, if you had kind of jumped <laughs> those chains and said, uh, you're gonna go from Stanford and you're gonna be in Kabul tomorrow, um, I would have been uh, kind of saying, you're crazy. <laughs> but at every step, it really was that growth for me was actually getting outside of the classroom. And a lot of this is that if you want to do something new, the path is gonna be different. Like, oh, for example, in all of your cases, I don't recommend going to Afghanistan right now um, in terms of solving that. But you should push yourself. And I think a lot of forces here, even in, even at Stanford and in the Valley, kind of encourage you to stay with what you're good at. And I would say like, that's correct in a certain sense, but most of the valuable things for me have been doing things that 
are different that seem interesting and are risk limited and then leaving myself uh, open to possibility. Um, the second one, and I'm kind of known for having sayings around the office, but I would really say uh, have a reality-based view of reality. And I think uh, this is extremely important in a lot of entrepreneurship where, especially for EE, um, you're taught a lot of great models and you're taught a lot of ways to think algorithmically and think in terms of systems and processes and apply a lot of precision. And the really interesting thing is that you're not taught when those models don't apply <laughs> into the real world. And um, I had a lot of cases when I was both in Afghanistan and working at DARPA and also working at Cadium where kind of the simple off the shelf method would have been kind of insane and not really useful. It's kind of like, you know, assume a Gaussian and then everything else works out. Uh, that really does not conform with a lot of the way that things work outside of these walls and that most of kind of the best results that I've had have been some from machine learning, others from just SQL statements, others from just summing and averaging things. And I think what's really guided me more than anything else is having an idea of kind of what's the end-to-end -end system and not being caught up just kind of in complexity that something is a shiny object or kind of an awesome machine learning algorithm, but that it actually is actionable and leads to, to better outcomes. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna say that uh, the, this is gonna be the most interesting aspect of your future careers, which is despite everything you've learned, the uh, most important decisions are not gonna have any, real, or any or almost no information available when you actually need to decide them. And this is gonna feel unsettling, <laughs> but you'll get used to it over time. And I think the, the best ones are one, being able to trust yourself in, in your intuition, two, being able to actually gather much, much more information about a situation rather than just taking it as it's presented to you. And uh, I have kind of a quote I like to end on, which um, is from General David, uh, excuse me, General David Petraeus, that uh, the absence of guidance or orders, uh, figure out what the orders should have been and execute them aggressively. And I think that that's really been kind of a sequence in a lot of things, which is basically stay curious, but then also pursue things even if you don't have a definite answer. And I think that especially for this class and going into entrepreneurship, you're going to want to do things differently. No one is, is going to be able to tell you, here's a path, here's what you should follow. Um, but you're actually going to need to figure things out a lot yourself. And it's gonna be uncomfortable because it's not what you're used to doing in classes, but that that's actually gonna be most of your lives going forward. And I just wanna kind of end with those and then say thank you. <laughs> Left a lot more time for questions, so. Questions? Yes. What did you major in and what did you pursue in grad school? And if you could go back, would you change either of those degrees? Uh, yes, so I did undergrad in physics. I did my master's and my PhD in electrical engineering. I focused on uh, optimization and machine learning, kind of how to scale those out. Um, going back and knowing now, um, I, would have done, I, would I would have done CS undergrad uh, for sure. And um, for grad school, uh, I had an amazing advisor in Stephen. I would not have changed that, but um, I think CS, undergrad, it kind of is the new physics <laughs> for a lot of things. And compared to most of your other classes, it is the most broadly applicable set of skills for today's workforce that we have. Um, you know, For my company in particular, we love hiring CS people with actually CS systems backgrounds because it means that you can actually build something new and you know how to architect it. If you do a lot of theory in practice, many things come from actually having experience and you know, if taking classes in just algorithms or taking classes in just theory are great, they inform. But if you actually want to have skills, you need to actually try to build things. And a lot of that is that we've done something that no one's done before in terms of actually building something to sense the internet. So then we have to think back and say, okay, we have absolutely no information on like chapter three. What should our KPIs be now that we've raised a series A? Like we're writing that book ourselves. So we have to chain things back and say, okay, how, how can people act? And how can people build something of value that's never been done before? Well, in other situations where that's happened, they have usefully repurposed skills, and we're an at scale software company, so we're going to start there. Yes? Um, so, and then who's um, all this data, who's it going to be available to? Like, will you, <laughs> is it mainly the governments, but also to? Uh, major companies or uh, plus what you sell to? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have information on the entire internet. Um, we have kind of very, very specific information on all systems that respond to public signals. We're very careful about privacy as a result of that. So basically any org, and this is a government agency, this is you know a large corporation, they're able to see systems that are relevant for them, which simply means systems that they own. Um, they're not able to see 
at kind of a fine level of detail um, anything about anybody else. You can get kind of aggregates about how you compare to peers, but um, you know, if somebody, you know, uh, I think the classic example is, is you know, if the Navy asks what the Air Force looks like, we're not gonna tell them and vice versa. They're allowed to see everything that they have so they can fix the problems, but um, outside of that, uh, you can do kind of a lot of bad things if you know where the vulnerabilities are. So we empower the defenders to be a lot faster than the attackers. At the same time, that means that we have to take access control and privacy extremely seriously um, and do not give out other information about things not related to your network of, um, of to our customers. Yes. You are uh, a business, so you have to pay people. You have some of the, uh, some of the investors mm -hmm. how how do you know how much to charge for what what you do <laughs> um a lot of it is that we go both for us based on kind of our costs and the value we provide and it is kind of a function of the complexity of the underlying network and also kind of you know what what our ongoing costs are going to be in supporting that account and uh, there's a multi-tiered uh, strategy but kind of Overall, it is you start with what you think is reasonable and then you evolve it as you have more customers and more customer types. And a lot of that is that if you're selling to a Fortune 10 company, their computer networks are hugely more complex than if you're selling even to say a Fortune 200 company. And we have scales that interpolate in between that. And we work with our customers both to show them the value of, of, of what we provide, but also make sure that the costs are reasonable. Um, are there other competitors in the cybersecurity sector that take a similar approach to what you guys are taking? And if so, how do you differentiate from them? Sure. Uh, there are aspects of, 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 what, of what we do that other companies do. So there are companies and institutions that do kind of internet-wide scanning. Um, there are other institutions that attempt to do th things like perimeter security checks. For us, kind of having the full system that comes together where there, you have both all this rich information about the internet, analytics that actually show why all these results are relevant to you, and kind of a web product that actually deploys throughout your security operations center, um, actually having all that hang together is very complicated. So um, I'm sure we have you know, competitors that are being born, you know, hopefully not in this room, but uh, at the same time to actually get kind of that full stack um, is very hard and we do not know of another company on the market for that. There are some aspects of what we do, but we, for our customers, they really see the value in the fully integrated solution. I just spoke about uh, you charge based upon how much it costs in some sense. Mm -hmm. How about the competition? Do, do, do you look in detail at what, what they charge for things? I think there, there are aspects of them. So there, there are some people that charge based on kind of data feeds. So you know, if, if you want something about a given IP address, you have kind of a query budget in various ways, and then you can kind of export JSON. So that's one method that people charge. Um, other, other, other competitors definitely are more of kind of a solutions type thing, which is much, much more opaque because you're, you're actually having bodies uh, built into that. And then, you know, enterprise salespeople kind of going out and kind of claiming all these extra things that they're gonna do. So for us, it's a balance. Um, and a lot of that is that, you know, it's fundamentally kind of a software as a service of component, but um, it's both more than data, and also we're not kind of doing the uh, consultants um, kind of security play, which is that f for th those of you that don't know, um, a lot of security companies rely very, very heavily on services, and there's pretty much kind of a customization is gonna be the dominant cost for most customers. Um, that's not the case for us, but we kind of sit you know, in between and kind of hopefully a nice, an, um, kind of a nice 80-20. Yes. What does the process look like when you send a packet through the internet to collect information on a device? Uh, sure. So it's gonna. So basically, there's the low level of kind of you know, uh, it's kind of the dual of the Google question. If you hit Google.com and you hit enter in Chrome, well, what happens? Um, for us, there are, are a variety of different protocols. So um, some, I'm sure. Everyone in this room is familiar with you know, HTTP, HTTPS. Um, there's some, such as one that I showed, that are very, very esoteric and proprietary to manufacturers. Um, they have names like, you know, like BACnet, uh, S7. One is actually called Ethernet IP, which is extraordinarily confusing um, for a lot of things because it's actually a protocol, not anything else. But there are large libraries of these that you get. What, step one is basically how do you launch and deploy those against the internet? And you can do that from a variety of ways. So step one is just 
you have a computer, you can cycle through you know, all IP addresses on the internet and you send it out. We do a lot of optimizations, both in terms of using kind of very, very good software, some from the open source community, others that we've written ourselves to make sure that that process is very fast. We also have distributed out um, in a variety of ways so that we can have very good fine grain of control and really understand what's going on. And then really receiving the signals back um, is kind of, you know, again, taking advantage of lots of different networking stacks around the world and then kind of throwing them out is um, a variety of different new techniques. If you're interested, there are rel no, not two new academic advancements, but um, there's um, a system called ZMAP and there's another one called MassScan. Um, we definitely take elements of those into our own system and then add a lot to that and then add other data sources to those as well. But uh, kind of like I hinted a few slides ago, the internet really is now small. Um, it is now possible to do a lot of this even off of a laptop, though um, in principle there are a lot of deployment issues and I definitely wouldn't recommend, I would recommend against doing that from anywhere on Stanford network because you will get a lot of abuse complaints and your RCC will be very annoyed at you. Yes. So in your opinion, what do you think is the most effective way to gain customers for a startup company? Mm -hmm. Or is it like a demo or, mm -hmm. or what was the most yeah. effective method you used? Uh, the most effective method for us was actually show and demonstrate value. <laughs> um, and and then, then I'll be specific about that, but like there are a number of different ways where you show it, but especially as a startup, um, large companies know that you're a startup and if you're afraid to give things away, <laughs> to them, um, you're not actually demonstrating value. You're saying that they can go elsewhere, they can not consume your product. For us, it was really showing people that they have issues on their networks, but that we are also kind of their partner and a trusted partner in helping them fix this problem. A lot of the, that, this is that for very large companies, kind of understanding everything that's, that is important to you is actually a very hard problem that internally they cannot solve. And until we came along and kind of invented the product category, they could not go elsewhere. So then with that, it's one kind of, showing them the value, but then also showing that we're gonna be a trusted partner in this and kind of help you along through the process with the software that we've written. Um, you know, in terms of consumer, uh, very, very different, but in terms of enterprise, it, it really is kind of, you know, it is a process. We sell to very long, large enterprises. Sales cycles can be very, very long, but at, at the same time, it really is, if you're actually showing value up and down the chain, um, if people will buy. Uh, how how do people learn about your stuff? They're a largest yep. company. Mm -hmm. They have lots of suppliers. Mm -hmm. You're just yep. one little company. Um, I'll be honest. Yeah. This is an area we're looking to improve in. Um, as we say, like we're a bunch of tech people. Like I'm not a sales guy <laughs> at all. Um, we're starting to hire a couple salespeople. We don't really do marketing yet. Um, some of it's been done um, on our behalf by some of our advisors. What we found is that in our space, it actually tends to be word of mouth. Um, that being said, uh, you know, this is kind of one of the next growth areas for us, which is uh, what does it mean for us to have kind of a more public presence? What does it mean for us to kind of have marketing that is honest about what we do and is not just kind of, you know, a, a bunch of noise? And how do we make that in such a way that it's kind of um, consistent with who we are as a business and what we do? So um, the, more, the more specific answer is through a lot of our advisors, uh, we're able to reach into sen senior levels of very large companies with specific introductions. Um, other customers act as referrals for us. And um, through that, we've been able to build a pretty amazing initial customer network. And then with government specifically, we have a lot of connections from our time there. And again, it's one of those like, who you know can get you in the door. It's the value you provide that will actually kind of open up a wallet after, you know, in some cases, a very large number of meetings. <laughs> All right.